Psalm 73, let's read that. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, as people turn back to them and find no fault in them, and they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. That's Psalm 73. So I hope you can see here how evil and the evil way of life, it's kind of enticing at times. But in the end, it's God that is everything that we want. Verse 1 is really kind of a a cornerstone statement for the whole, the whole psalm here. Uh, the key belief statement, that is, God is good to His people. God is good to His people. Those who believe in Him, corporately Israel, and individually those who are pure in heart, God is good to His people. You almost got the impression when I was reading this again this week that, that um, this is kind of the starting point and it's also where the psalmist will end, but it's almost like this is, what, this is what I always grew up believing and learning and hearing. God is good. And as you can see, it's all over the Psalms, God's goodness. I mean, it's all over the Bible, but the Psalms especially really stand out saying God is good in, in so many different ways. So this is the truth that the psalmist heard growing up, and it's a recurring point. It's something that you and I grew up hearing, too. God is good. But then when we get a little older, you know, when, from when we're young and then we get a little older, we start to see that, you know, the, the bad people seem to succeed a lot and seem to do well. And then it kind of challenges us a little bit. So verse 1 is like the key belief statement, and then the rest of the psalm is like a personal testimony. It talks about kind of how he was, he was wondering, questioning, doubting, and then he kind of comes back up out of that. 
So it's almost like giving a personal testimony of, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So even, even when you're raised in the church, you have, you have your moments where maybe you have some doubts, maybe you have some discouraging moments or, or something, and then, and then God brings you back around again. We, we have those stories. And uh, Psalm 73, a psalm of Asap. Asap is not an exception. Verse 3 states the problem. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I was envious of them. They were, they were prosperous. So the problem is that the wicked are succeeding. And you don't have to look too far to see examples of this in our daily life. I mean, there's a lot of politicians, there's a lots of people in Hollywood, there's a lot of people on Wall Street who are just simply ruthless, they're godless, and they don't really care about people, and they're making it big. They're very wealthy, and they're very successful. What, what's going on with this? It seems like if you look around the world, you see that the most ruthless often win, the greediest get wealth, the charmers find romance, and the godless get the microphones. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, God, is, God is good, but the bad guys are the ones that are succeeding. By appearances, it looks like wickedness is the way to a good life. And he goes on for a number of verses there, giving specific examples. So verse 4, they, they eat well. Verse 5, they don't have as many problems as everybody else does. 6, they hold their heads high and they destroy who they want. Verse 8, they speak as if others are their own work animals. You know, they, they speak uh, harshly. And then verse 9, they speak against God in heaven and people on earth. It's like their, their tongues know no respect at all. Verse 10, they're popular. Everybody comes to them and gets to enjoy their success. Verse 11, they say God doesn't know or doesn't care one or the other. Yeah, well, God's not going to do it. I'm doing just fine by myself. I guess God doesn't see the evil I'm doing or He doesn't care either way. Verse 12, the wicked are always at ease in wealth is basically what he said. Always at ease, they increase in riches. So, at this point here, this is, this is, this is kind of discouraging. This is a lot, a lot, to, lot to take in here. They're, they're doing well. They don't care about God. They don't fear Him. They don't have any faith. And look at their success. So, based on all of this evidence... Verses 13 through 15, there's kind of a crisis of faith. So I was, I was, I kind of was starting to lose faith a little bit here. I, I felt like a chump for seeking God's righteousness. I was, I was trying to follow the Lord and, and I, I feel like I've been had. I, I made all of these sacrifices for Him and, and I exercised self control. I resisted temptation and what did it, where did it get me? Nowhere. In verse 1, it says God is good to the pure in heart. And then in verse 13 there, he said, Surely or all in vain have I kept my heart clean. So, he's kind of like, man, this was all for nothing. I've been, I've been trying to follow the Lord and it's, it's all for nothing. Um, verse 15, he he says, if I had said I would speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He's, he's worried, boy, if I, if I were to say any of this out loud, then I'd lead all kinds of kids astray. You know, kids are looking to the adults for how to live and what life is about. And boy, if I were to start talking like this, they would, they would be lost. But verse 16, nothing made sense. Yeah, that, this is kind of maybe his lowest point here, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a, a wearisome task. 
he's, he's a little bit of sense of hopelessness there. It's like, ha, oh, I, can't, I can't understand this. Boy, even just trying sounds exhausting. I, I, I don't know where to go. And then in verse 17, there's the turning point. It just kind of turns around right there. I kind, of, I kind of put a little line right there in my Bible because that's where it turns a corner. He, he's kind of going down, down, down. Bad guys are, are succeeding. Crisis of faith. And then in verse 17 where he says, until that's where, okay, we're going to turn a corner here. So verse 17, it was God's sanctuary that opened his eyes. It was in your sanctuary. The sanctuary of the Lord. And it's maybe worth noting at this point that what he's talking about is is the temple. There's There's a place in the temple where God's people gather for worship. And they would, if you're in Jerusalem, you'd gather every Sabbath. And if you lived far away, you would gather there for some of the festivals and such. So that's kind of what he talks, he's talking about. Um, but there's, for us too, I mean, we call this room here the sanctuary for a reason. Because when we all gather together, this is where the Lord is. And there's something about corporate worship that reorients our perspective on things. That kind of makes us see the world and life like we're really supposed to, for what it really is. It's the reason why we still do worship together in the 21st century. People have been gathering in the name of the Lord for centuries Even in the Old Testament, they did that. There's a reason why we do that. It refocuses us. I mean, we're here to bless the Lord. This is the Lord's time, but we get benefits out of it too. Verses 18 through 20, he kind of sees the evil and the wicked for what they really are. The wicked have destruction coming. Okay, yeah, they're doing okay right now, but boy... Their future is not good. God lets them have their moment, but eternity is awaiting, if not sooner. I mean, some some wicked people, they they get their justice or some of it, even in this life. But even if they got away with everything in this life, they got eternity, and that is awaiting them. Verse 18, they are sliding into ruin. Verse 19, they are overthrown in a moment of terror. That uh, sounds kind of frightening. Verse 20, they are nothing but shadows. It's like they're about as significant as a dream is. In verses 20 and 21, the Asaph here is kind of has a moment where he was like, boy, Lord, I was, I was insane for envying them. Well, I, was, I was an unthinking animal in, in envying them. You know, animals, some of you are more acquainted with animals than I am, but animals don't usually think too far ahead. They're, they're usually, you know, in their, their day-to-day, moment-to-moment needs, and we can think like that. You know, boy, the, the wicked are sure succeeding, and here I am doing the right thing, and I'm getting, I'm getting trampled by all the wicked. Maybe this is all in vain. Well, look a little farther ahead. It looks a little different that way. Verses 21 and 22, I was an unthinking animal. Verse 23, this is where, this is where it really gets cool. Verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. It, in these next verses here, I, you, you can almost sense the delight in the heart here as he's saying this. I am always with the Lord who holds my hand. And there's a picture there. And the picture is, it's like a, a little child who, who holds mom or dad's hand 
like when they need to cross the street. So we're, there's a busy road, and we got to cross the street, and mom and dad, they, they can pay attention to all this stuff. I'm not used to this yet, but I'm going to hold on to them, and, and we'll get across the street safe. That was one thing that my parents would say, hold my hand while we cross the street. But you have a picture here of a child who's trusting the loving guidance of a parent here. I'm always with the Lord. He, he holds my hand. It's like a childlike faith there that's just really tender and, and sweet, and you can sense the delight there. Verse 24. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. There's not a lot of statements in the Old Testament that talk about eternal life. There's a couple, not many. Most of the time when the Old Testament talks about death, then you go to this place called Sheol or the grave, and it's not really that pleasant of a place. But there's a couple times in the Old Testament where there's a hint about a, a glorious afterlife, and this is one of them. It made me think of, um, made me think of uh, where it says in Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So in life, we have God's good commands, and in death, He takes us to glory. This is what this says. So, like we just sang, in great is thy faithfulness, strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. God gives us his commands to follow. He, he guides our steps. Here's, here's the good way here that I'm leading you on. And then after, after life ends, as it will for all of us, then we get glory. So this is, this is a wonderful deal that God has for us here. He's given us his good commands for today and then for eternity we have glory to look forward to. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Verse 25, this is, kind of, this is kind of the one verse that maybe stands out to me the most. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. That's quite a statement. Knowing God Himself is everything our heart desires. And I've only been walking with Jesus for, for 42 years, but I'm realizing this more and more. That everything that really I, I desire in my heart, I can find in the Lord. He is everything that I'm really looking for out of life. Knowing God Himself a statement that comes to mind that I've heard before goes something like this. Everyone who goes to a brothel is really looking for Jesus. And after I heard that, I, it kind of clicked for me. You know what? Pretty much every sin that we commit is the wrong way to reach for what Jesus really offers. All, all sin is like a counterfeit salvation or a counterfeit joy or delight of some kind. So you can have sex with a prostitute, but only Jesus will give you intimacy. You can get revenge on an enemy, but Jesus gives us true justice. You can steal money, but Jesus gives us true riches. You can cave into laziness, but Jesus gives true rest. You can be right in your own eyes, but Jesus makes us right in God's eyes. You can seek greatness by worldly standards. Jesus offers us greatness by heavenly standards. You can try to play God. You can try to control everything and everyone in your life and situate it just as you want. Or you can follow Jesus and see how God's perfect plan will unfold. Even if it's not your plan. The more you know Jesus, the less you want to sin. This is basically what I'm discovering as I'm walking with him. And I'm not all the way there yet, for sure, but 
but the more that I know Jesus, the, the less sin seems like a good deal. Why would I want to do that? That just seems, that just, no, I don't, I don't need to, I don't want to. His death and resurrection not only takes sins away, it gives us full access to God the Father in heaven. And when you have full access to God the Father in heaven, then there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. That is when that reaches its full truth. Ephesians 1 verse 3, I have that on the screen. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Right now, you and I, in Jesus, have every spiritual blessing that there is in heaven. And when you have that, who cares about this stuff now? It just changes you. The real challenge is to to walk by faith instead of sight. You can look around and see how the wicked are succeeding and the money that they're earning and the power and the prestige that they're gaining. And you can think, oh man. But if you look up, if you look into eternity, it looks a lot different. It looks a lot different. The challenge is to walk by faith instead of sight. And the challenge is to trust God's ways instead of our own. God's ways might not seem all that exciting or glamorous or profitable, but He knows what He's talking about. He's our Heavenly Father, and He wants what's best for us. And so when we just trust that He knows what He's talking about, and that He actually loves us, and He's not holding out on us, we will see what he's talking about. And we will grow up into that. Verse 26, I am, he basically says, I am weak and mortal, but God is my strength and eternal joy. He, he kind of recognizes, boy, I, I'm weak, I'm mortal, my flesh and my heart, they're going to fail. But God's not going to fail. He's my, he's my strength and he is my portion forever. I, I, I get to belong to him forever. Not just in this life, but for eternity too. This is amazing. I, I just get so much joy out of this. God is, God is my strength and my portion forever. He is my eternal joy. And then 27 and 28, he kind of gives a summary. 27, behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. So those who reject the Lord, they're doomed. And they might might be having a having it good right now. Maybe maybe today, maybe this year, maybe this lifetime even. But boy, they've got something coming and it is not good. I do not want to be them. Some see doom on the earth, but all of the wicked will see doom in eternity. And then 28, but for me it's just good to be near the Lord. I have made the Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all His wondrous works. I delight in the Lord who protects me. This is, this is my delight, and He takes care of me. So even if the evil people right now are trampling me and taking advantage of me, and, and maybe I'm getting the short end of the stick right now, but the Lord is going to protect me, and He is my portion forever. I really like this psalm. Because it does acknowledge that, boy, we can be tempted by evil sometimes, and it can, those roads can look pretty attractive sometimes, but when you look at it from the Lord's perspective, He knows what He's talking about. And just God Himself is wonderful and amazing. And if we can find delight in Him, all these other things, they just kind of fade away. Psalm 73, it's a good one. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord God in heaven, you are are a good God. And Lord, you've created us to know you and to love you and to find all of our, our delight in you and all that you give to us. 
Oh Lord, we pray that we would not be dazzled or tempted by, by anything around us, and that, Lord, we would not be distracted, but instead we would live by faith in you instead of our sight, and that, Lord, more and more each one of us would find delight in who you are so that we would not be tempted or distracted by anything else. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.